Looking for a podcast where you can hear from some of the great hockey legends, hear them tell some stories, find out what they're up to today? Well, you're in the right place. It's the Domino's Pizza Overtime Podcast. I'm your host, Gino Retta. Today's guest, a two-time Stanley Cup champion. He won with the Canes in 06, and he won with the Hawks in 2010. He was the last captain of the Atlanta Thrashers before they relocated to Winnipeg and became the Winnipeg Jets. A member, and this is a personal aside, of one of the greatest world junior teams ever assembled that won gold in Grand Forks, North Dakota in 2005. My buddy, Andrew Ladd. Andrew, great to see you, my friend. You look fantastic. Thanks, Gino. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's great to be here. and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel old, so I may look better than I feel sometimes. <laughs> it's funny, you know, because I was looking back, I was looking back at the stuff you did, and it was like, oh, yeah, Grand Forks. I was there. I was at that event. It was, And we'll talk about that in a second. Oh, yeah, yeah, 2006, I was there. I was there with the celebrations on the ice. Oh, 2010, I was there. They were great moments for me, but clearly better moments for you. You got your little cups behind you there. That's yeah. nice. Uh, yeah. Sounds that totally most, fun to put them. The, the most important question I'm going to ask you before I ask you anything else is, have you ever been as cold as you were when we were in Grand Forks for the World Junior in 2005? Uh, yes. I mean, I lived, I lived in Winnipeg for five years, so <laughs> there's a few moments there, uh, in Grand Forks and Winnipeg are pretty, pretty similar, but I, I, you know, what? I actually don't remember a whole lot about that. I, 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 we were inside a lot. My parents, I remember them talking about the snowstorm to get to the games and like the craziness that was, that was, uh, just even driving down from Winnipeg. Um, but we were like, we were always in a nice warm bus and it was, uh, it was pretty cozy for us. It was cold. And you know what? The the Just to remind people what happened in 05, that was um, the lockout season. The NHL canceled the entire 2004-2005 NHL season. So everybody, uh, even the high draft picks who were eligible to go to the NHL, ended up playing at the World Junior. So Ovi was playing. Malkin was playing. Uh, you were the fourth overall pick. You were playing. Um, I think Kessel was playing. Crosby was there. Like that roster was unbelievable. What was it like to be a part of really one of the greatest world junior hockey championships ever played? Yeah, it was, I think everyone knew going in, it was going to be a special team. Um, you know, they had a lot, they had so many returning players in the year before when they lost in heartbreaking fashion uh, in the gold medal game. Uh, so, you know, I think three quarters of the team was coming back. So the, automatically you're a favorite. And then the lockout happens. So, you know, I would say probably half the guys that were on the team probably wouldn't even have been there uh, because they would have been playing in the NHL. So uh, I, I remember just thinking like, oh, like I just want to be a part of this in any way, shape or form, because we knew uh, I don't think there was a doubt that we were going to we were going to win that tournament uh, in our own minds. Um, so you wanted to be a part of, of, of that group and and doing something special. What did the World Junior Championship mean to you? I mean, I know you've got two cups, and we're going to talk about that. There's something unique and something different about the World Juniors there. Yeah, you know, it, I always tell people I didn't grow up uh, thinking um, of playing in the NHL, like it, which is weird to say. Like, I grew up watching the World Juniors and being like, uh, like you know, Boxing Day. Wow, like one day I would love, like, love to have the opportunity to to do that. And I even at that point I thought like, hey, that was just a pipe dream. Um, and even two years before that, I thought it was a pipe dream. <laughs> so it happened pretty quick for, for me going from playing junior B and a couple years later being a part of that. Um, but it, it really is for, for a kid growing up in Canada, like, uh, and I don't know if it's changed today, but like when I was a young kid, it was like, that was a tournament I watched every single year. Uh, and, and you learned who the players were and, you know, a lot of the world junior players that went on to maybe have average NHL careers, but like you knew their, their, their world junior moments and how, how they played in those tournaments. So, uh, for me, it was, it, it really was like, my dream was to be a part of that tournament in some way when I was a kid, uh, way before playing in the NHL. And you got to share it with Crosby, Shea Weber, Ryan Getzlaff, Corey Perry, Patrice Bergeron, not a bad thing. Now. There is a downside to your timing, though. Your timing was great, and then you got to be a part of that team. But you get drafted in June 2004. You go fourth overall, and there's no hockey. Mm -hmm. There's no NHL. 
What was that like for you? Because I, I imagine that had to be a pretty roller coaster type emotional thing for you. Yeah, it was it was an interesting time for sure. Um, yeah, I don't. I remember being disappointed that like, hey, you're not like you didn't get to do camp and all that stuff. And um, but I, it was such a it was such a crazy ride for me before that. I, I went from playing junior A to like trying out for the, for the Calgary Hitman. And all of a sudden I got drafted fourth overall. So um, it, it, it really was like, Oh, like I was, I was excited to obviously um, get drafted and be a part of that. But like, I was just excited to even go back to Calgary and like, Hey, have the opportunity to, to play another year in junior for, for my WHL team. So uh, there was disappointment, but I, I also was excited to, to go back in and be a leader on, on my junior team and have the FD, you knew world juniors coming around the corner. So that was on my mind. Um, so I think you just kind of look towards, Hey, what's that next thing that I can get excited about. And then you didn't have to wait very long, brother, because in your rookie season, Oh, five, Oh six, yeah. things happen pretty fast. You were surrounded by a great cast. You had, you know, Rod Brindamore, Brett Hedekin, Mark Recchi. You had a pretty solid cast. What was that like to be a part of that? I mean, this is your, you're so early in your NHL career. How old were you then? Like 20, 21 years old? I was 19 to start that year. So I turned yeah. 20 way through the year. Yeah. yeah. So as a 20 year old, you're part of a Stanley Cup winning team with the Carolina Hurricanes. What was that like? Oh man. It was like, uh, looking back now, I have way more perspective on like, oh man, like you were really lucky to be a part of that group. <laughs> Um, you know, when you're in the moment as a 20 year old, don't play it down. You contribute it. It's not like you were just flying along. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I just, I mean more like being a part of that moment and realizing how big it was and how impactful it was to have all the guys that you listed around me as a young player and the influence that they had on how I prepared for games, um, you know, professionally away from the rank, how I took care of my body, all those things. Like you're like, that was a, massive learning curve for me in a very short amount of time that I had to, or I, I got to be a part of. So, um, that, that is like, now that I look back, I'm like, Oh, that like sticks out. Yes. Like, Hey, that was a time, like amazing time for me. Like, Hey, I was young, dumb and enjoying the ride and, um, got to play, you know, I was on a line with Ray Whitney and Matt Cullen and, and I was the guy that would run around and, and create turnovers and, and run people over. And, um, you know, it, it was really a fun group to be a part of. And, and there's, you know, that it was a weird coming out of that lockout because all the rule changes and, and everything that was happening, there was no more clutching and grabbing. So like the game really evolved quickly. Uh, and, and I thought our team was on the cutting edge of, uh, and that's Peter Laviolette really was the driving force behind that of, of playing with speed and playing with skill and getting, getting your D up the ice and, and really um, taking advantage of all those different aspects of the game. What's it like when you uh, first hoist the Stanley cup? Oh, it's, it's a very surreal feeling. Um, just even thinking about like, Hey, how many people have had the opportunity to do this? And, and I think one of the unique things for me was being around so many veteran players that had been, our, had played 20 years you know, watch Rod Brindamore and, and him <clears throat> until this day. I, I think he has one of the best uh, cup presentations of all time. And just like when he grabs that thing, you can see the passion and the, uh, the, just the energy and the emotion of like lifting and, and capturing a goal that he had been dreaming about for his entire life. And, and to know like how difficult it was for him throughout his whole career to even get back and get another chance. And he had been close a few times. And uh, so it's, that's one of the things I remember the most was like watching the veteran guys in that room and them talking about, Hey, like this doesn't happen very often, you know, and I'm the, I'm the, the dumb 20, 20 year old going, Oh, like, this is great. This is, you know, first year. Right. Um, and, 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 <laughs> As my career went on, I was like, oh yeah, they were like, they were, they were bang on. Um, but it definitely had an impact on, on me as I moved uh, throughout my career. A day that I remember, and I'm sure you remember it very well, uh, February of 2008, we're working the NHL trade deadline at TSN. You've been a cane for two and a half years. You want to Stanley Cup with them. And we find out you're on the move. Mm -hmm. We found out through the insiders. How did you find out? And what was that like when you heard? 
How did I do? So I was sitting in the, we had, a, we had a game that day. So I was having pregame meal in the arena and then our, our uh, team service director, Brian Tatum uh, at the time in, in Carolina, uh, I remember he came in and he was like, Hey, ladder, uh, lobby wants to see you. And my heart just went sunk into my stomach. I was like, okay. So, um, it was an interesting few minutes. Cause I was like, I went and talked to lobby lobby. He's like, I think you've been traded. Uh, but just wait here to confirm. I was like, uh, okay. And then my, my phone started blowing up my agent, my girlfriend, they have probably been watching you guys. And, uh, <laughs> So uh, I was like talking to my agent and I was like, I think you're going to Chicago. Um, so I, I hung out for a few minutes and then I guess waiting to the, for the trade to get confirmed. And then Lavi came back and was like, yeah, yeah, like you're going to Chicago. Um, and, you know, then the, the rest is history. Dale Town reaches out. You're on a plane a few hours later and, and off to Chicago. Did I hear you had an interesting scenario at the airport with the oh, guy yeah. you, <laughs> you want to share that? Like, yeah. That's really awkward. Yeah. So as I was, this is like, the, as I was flying out, so I was in the Raleigh Durham airport, I was sitting waiting for my flight to Chicago. And, um, all of a sudden I see Ron Francis coming, like walks by me to the gate and they're grabbing Tuomo Rutu off the plane to take him to the game. Um, that's so oh, weird that he's coming in on the plane that you're about to fly back out on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a weird moment. Right. Cause like yeah, at that time I thought I was, yeah, I was, one, you know, one of their young draft picks. So yes. we had a really old team and it was like, okay, like I had in my head, I was like, Oh, I'm going to be here for a long time. Uh, I was really close with Eric Stahl and Cam Ward. Um, so it was, uh, it was a gut punch for me for sure. And then, you know, you have time to like settle down and reevaluate and get excited about, you know, the opportunity ahead. And again, things work out really well. <laughs> so you've come off a world junior championship during a lockout. You're one of the best teams ever. You go right into Carolina, you win a Stanley Cup. Two and a half years later, you go to the Chicago Blackhawks, an organization that hadn't won the Cup in 49 years. Now you've got guys like Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves, Duncan Keith, Marion Hossa. What was that ride like on the way to the 2010 Stanley Cup? Yeah, it was, uh, it felt different than Carolina. Um, and I think it, that part of that was like me having the experience of winning in Carolina coming in and, and we had such a young team that it was, there's a really comfort level for me as a leader going in there and being like, Hey, like this is, uh, I can lead here and I can, I can, um, show them a lot of what I learned in Carolina. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was really like a, a perfect storm. But yeah, obviously you had Johnny and Kaner and, and, but we had so many people around them, you know, like you said, the Marion hosts, Patrick Sharps, um, of the world, uh, Duncan Keith, Brent Seabrook. They're just like a, a lot of really solid leaders. Uh, and, and when people talk about like, you know, I, I always think it's funny when people talk about one specific leader of a team and, and all the great teams I've been on, it's been a group of leaders that have helped helped uh, create that culture and, and, and influence um, that organization. And that was, that was really us doing that together. Um, and, and, Cause everybody kind of got there at the same time. And, and when we could build that and, and hold each other accountable and, and it, it really was like when, when I think back of like trying to like pin down, like, Hey, why did we have success? We, we fought like brothers. Yeah. Um, and, and part of that was like, we would be pissed off at each other. We'd fight and we'd bitch and complain at each other on the bench. And, uh, but it was all in, uh, we all knew it was coming from a place of like wanting to push each other to a higher level. And, and because we cared about, uh, obviously winning, but obviously we, we, we cared about each other and like the potential that we had as a group. So to me, that's really what carried that group forward. And, and, and Joel, uh, Quimble was really good at spearing, spearheading and, and providing structure to that. I will say, and then another weird scenario, because as, as you're celebrating the Stanley Cup, as you're going, you know, yeah. in your summer, enjoying the summer, you got all your Hawks paraphernalia on and uh, you're, you know, you're celebrating the Cup and you find out you're traded yeah. to the Atlanta Thrashers. Mm -hmm. Not exactly like one thing to get dealt to the Hawks to get sent to the Atlanta Thrashers. That was a different kind of organization. How did that all unfold for you? 
Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, the whole trade scenario was much different because I, I knew, like I had talked to Stan um, Bowman, who was a GM at the time. And he, we, he'd say, Hey, like, we'd love to keep you, but you'd have, you know, you're gonna have to stay for essentially half of what we're paying you right now. Salary cap. Yeah. Yeah. The salary cap. Um, and it, it was actually like, I think Taves and Kane had, they got bonuses for, for us winning the Stanley cup. And I think, um, you know, Kaner, is that the year Kaner got the consequence? Yes. Yeah. 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 So Kaner got the consequence. So there was bonuses there. And, uh, yeah. So like, because of that, the overages, like it really screwed us. So, and Atlanta was really like the last place I, I thought I would go because we already had like, they already already made a trade with them. So like, buff went there and Sopel and eager and um they had already been traded to atlanta so uh it wasn't on my mind or thinking about other things and all of a sudden so i knew the trade was going to happen so that that's that's why it was different um and then but also i wasn't thinking atlanta and it was you know again it was like a shock and like okay cool <laughs> reevaluate the ladder like you're going from chicago blackhawks a first class organization that is not afraid to spend some cash mm-hmm. to I had a thrashers where they were throwing nickels around like manhole covers. Like what was, what was that like, man? Yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting. Um, you know, I had familiar Rick Dudley was there and I knew Rick from his time in Chicago. So, um, that was, that was helpful. And, uh, John Torchetti was an assistant in Chicago. So I know I had a few, few people there, but organizationally it was, uh, it was interesting. I, I still remember like one of the first exhibition games we went in, for pregame meal, we had pregame meal and there was no food left. Um, and we had to like pre, we, we, we told them ahead of time, like, Hey, what we wanted. So we want like, you know, pasta and like how many pieces of chicken. Okay. Two pieces of chicken and in great. So like I, I went in and there's like no food. I'm like, what's going on here. And, uh, what had happened was a P- Patrice Carmier, who was like a young prospect who was hurt at the time was just like, Hey, well, this is the NHL. Like we were, you know, this is meals for everybody. It's, you know, it's so you went in and ate. So by the time I got there, there was no food. So, uh, so it became this, this big thing. And then, um, and then the next game I came in and there was like toothpicks with, with names on every. Oh, uh, and, uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I think that it was like 10 bucks a piece of chicken. So I'm like, yeah, like I, I feel like they're even making money off of us. Um, so it, it definitely was a, a, a different, uh, organizationally a different fit. What I had heard was, uh, in order to, to buy the basketball team, they had to buy the hockey team. So it was a, it was a, a pair of things. So you had a bunch of owners that really their focus was basketball. And there was a few that cared about the hockey and, um, you know, the, uh, Don Waddell there and he was great and cared. Um, but uh, you know, you're, you're handcuffed by, um, how much you can spend and, and, and all that different stuff. So, it was, it was, it, Hey man, everything's an experience. And I, I, like I said, I've learned a lot from my time there and, um, in a short time, but I, I enjoyed living in Atlanta. I'll tell you that. You went from a place which was hot, but not really a hockey hotbed to place Winnipeg where they know your hockey. You mm-hmm. could walk around at a, you know, grab a cup of coffee somewhere and no one's going to recognize you in Atlanta. You're gold, <laughs> you know, but yeah. you can't do that in Winnipeg. Yeah. So, now the, the organization, after one year in Atlanta, you get shifted to Winnipeg. What was that like for you? Well, I, I, first off, I don't think people realize how how quickly that hit us as players. Like, I think people have the assumption that we knew before time and before the news hit. And, like, it was like, no, I, I was watching TSN and all of a sudden it was like, hey, like, Atlanta's moving to Winnipeg. And it was like, holy shit. Like, well, you know, what do we do now? Uh, <laughs> So, and, but for me, man, I, I, I had at that point had enough success that I was excited to go to an organization that cared about winning and cared about like, how do I create a, a great experience for the players and organizationally? So, um, it, it wasn't hard to get excited about what was, uh, what was going to happen there in terms of, um, going to a, to a place that is excited to, to, to watch hockey and have a hockey team back. And like that arena is going to be packed every night. Um, so from an energy, like just a pure, like, Hey, energy excited to play. And like, that's, you know, it's a grind playing 82 games when it, when that 
that stadium is is half full every night on you know on Tuesday you know there's eight thousand people in the crowd, so to be able to like go to a place that was just absolutely nuts about hockey and was going to be jammed with with fourteen thousand people and I had played an exhibition game there in uh, before we went to Grand Forks for World Juniors so like I always had that memory in my bank of like man this is going to be this is going to be awesome so. Uh, it, yeah, again, it was like, okay, cool. Like you're looking at like, hey, how, where am, where am I getting excited about this? And, and, uh, but it happened like really fast. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, you had a good run there with the Jets. Things went real well there. Then you get dealt back to the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, that was a bit of a brief stay. I got to ask you about one thing. Is it true that you actually FaceTimed your wife while she was giving birth? <laughs> Did that really happen? Is that a real story? Oh yeah, I I have so I I missed two out of three of my kids' births. Um, so I was we we my wife's she was at that time. Well, she would have been a month out from her due date, yeah. and uh, so I was pretty comfortable. Like hey, like you know she should be fine. So we fly from Winnipeg to Dallas. I landed I landed Dallas. Get to the hotel and. Uh, we're all there's like no boo in the in the in the lobby so we're all gonna go down and, and and eat together and my phone rings and then you know immediately i was like gosh shit here we here we go um so uh and i everything was so new so like we had a new new team service guy you know it's 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 it, there's an evolution of like hey learning how our world works and like and every part of it um so i'm like hey man like i gotta get back to winnipeg so, so his name is Chris Kreviazic and, and he's like, okay, yeah. Um, so he comes like, text me. He's like, I, I think I can get you there by like four 30 tomorrow afternoon. And I'm like, dude, that's like, that's not going to work. I had to fly to like Toronto and connect the next morning. I'm like, no, that's not going to work. It, his wife never had any babies. He didn't understand the dynamic. Uh, he, really he, well. he was in his early twenties. He, he was, he was very, uh, raw. Uh, and so, um, uh, it was he starts looking at private? I'm like, okay, let's see if there's any private planes. I knew Mark Recky. Mark, Mark, I think he was in Dallas at the time, and I was like, hey, like, do you know anybody that could we can get a plane here and and I can get back? And uh, so uh, we start looking at that. So he's going and checking with these private plane companies and coming back and forth to me. So at, at this point, my wife is like in labor, and she's there with Brian Little's girl uh, girlfriend at the time, wife now. And so, so my wife went to, went to the hospital with Blake Wheeler's wife and, um, and, uh, Brian Little's girlfriend at the time. And, you know, so she doesn't have any girls. So she's there and she's got the, she's got the phone. And as my wife's like going through labor in birth, like in a lot of pain and screaming. And so at mid like scream, he, the crev knocks on the door and I open it up and she's like, you know, she's giving birth. So <laughs> Uh, and, and like his face was just like, uh, I'll come back. I'm like, okay, good idea. So then he took off and, and, uh, and when we figured out, so I ended up watching the rest of the, she, she gave birth so quickly. I watched on FaceTime, ended up getting, uh, a private jet and, and able to get back to Winnipeg at least, uh, to get there oh, a few hours later. That's legendary. That's awesome. I've yeah. I like heard I heard rumors about that, but I never saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Get ready for the game with the Domino's eight ninety nine mix and match deal. Score big with any medium two topping pizza and any two items like pastas, stuffed cheesy bread, boneless chicken, or classic chicken wings. Domino's has you covered. Order today from Canada's favorite pizza at Domino's.ca. I mean the stuff that the stuff that's happened to you is amazing. Now there were also some rough times too. Mm -hmm. When you, you know, by the tail end of your career, you started getting hit with some injuries. I think there was a stretch where you were. I think when you were with the Islanders, or were you the Hawks when you had the two major knee surgeries and a. Yeah, I was. I was in Long Island. Um, so I played like eight games. Tore my meniscus on my right side, but they did a meniscal repair. You know, did a four month recovery. Came back, played six more games and then someone sideswiped my other knee and blew out my other knee in, in the same year. Yeah. What's that like for you? I mean, you go to the emotional highs of, you know, all the success you had and that all that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But when you're like, you just want to stay healthy. Like now you've got kids, you, you're thinking about your future and all the stuff starts going. Then, then after the injuries, 
there's, you know, being waved and up and down to the minors. And you really like that. I mean, emotionally, to, to the extent that you feel comfortable sharing this, what's yeah. that like for you from a mental health standpoint when you're having to deal with all that and you're still a father mm-hmm. trying to take care of your family and they want to know, dad, where are we going to be living? What's going to be going on? What was that like for you? Yeah, every every moment provided probably something different for me. Um, and, and yeah, like there, there's the like when hey, when you're or you're after sixty or fifteen years, you're put on waivers and sent to the minors, and uh, not knowing if you're going to come back. Like you know, at that point, like hey, there's like an embarrassment and shame, and and all that stuff comes up. Um, and and I would say like. For for me, I, uh, my habit was like, hey, I would just internalize everything, take everything on, and then just keep working hard. Like I would, I you know, I worked my ass off, and 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 like, hey, I'll just work through this and get back to it. And I was doing that, and it was like hitting a wall. It wasn't working. It wasn't working. Um, and it just kept like building in my head, building in my head, and then you know, there's it's, it's a pretty heavy weight. And I, I think one thing people uh, they they might get this or not is like, hey, like it's it's actually a pretty lonely place to be as an athlete. Um, Cause not many people really can relate to where you're at. Yeah. And, and then you're, and then you're actually, there's, 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 there's fear of like judgment from other like teammates of like, Oh, I don't, I'm not going to show them that I'm like going through this. Right. Um, so, and then other people, it's like, Oh, like, dude, you're making $5 million a year. Like why? Like, you know, quit being a baby. Like why you, you know, it's it hard though, man. Things yeah. still yeah. Um, and it is, it's like, Hey, like you're human. So everyone experiences things and, 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 um, the human emotion and aspects of what you're going through hit home. Uh, so, so to me, that was the hardest part is like, I, I was so used to being able to just keep overcoming. Uh, and I had done that from the time I was, you know, 12, like my mom always said like, Hey, just, if you want to introduce something, just tell me, can't do it. And he'll, he'll figure out a way to do it. Uh, and, and I was good at that. Like I was good at like when I got cut multiple times and, and by the Vancouver giants, like kept going and working and, and, you know, and then I got, I made it to the WHL and then I got trapped and like kept going. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, it was, it, it was uh, like, I, I felt like helpless and disempowered and just like, I was like, Oh, this is all happening to me. And we've already talked about all the things that, that <laughs> all the great things that I'd gone through. But in that moment, it was just like, it was like a one loss after another, after another. And it was just like, Oh man, like I just felt defeated. Um, so that was probably the the best way to put it. It was just a massive weight that I was holding inside, uh, and, and trying to handle all of my, all of my own. So how did you handle it? How did you get through it? What was the key? Yeah. So I, my wife was a big advocate for me. Um, I was like, I was very distant at home. Um, so I like, again, internalizing. So I was like processing, I'm, Usually if you're seeing me and I'm like, I'm like, you can, my eyes are going on. I was like, I'm processing things. And I, so when I was home, I was at, I was like bitter, angry, uh, all those different things. And, and I, I knew it, uh, obviously, but, uh, she was like, Hey, like you, you need to talk to someone like you're not yourself right now. You don't have to talk to me, like, but find someone, uh, I'll help you find someone if you want, like, like you, you need to get whatever's going on in your head out and, and start to deal with it. So that, that was a big turning point for, for me. And I, I, it was almost like I was just waiting for permission for someone to be like, yeah, do this. And I'm like, okay, yeah, all right, I'm going to go find someone. Um, so I was actually like driving from Bridgeport, or sorry, from Long Island. So Garden City, New York to Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is like a two hour drive, hour and a half, two hours, depending on traffic. Lovely, lovely New York traffic. Um, and uh, I, Thomas Hickey was in the same situation with me at that time. So he was driving back and forth. So we would drive together and he was working with a, uh, a mental performance coach um, in uh, that he liked. And I, it was it was funny, like, because I remember him telling me how much he paid for this performance coach. And I knew I was like, oh, like hip kicks is cheap. Like he doesn't spend a lot of money. And he told me how much he was spending on this this coach. And I was like. I mean, I get pick suspended, but this has to be good. So I, uh, I was like, yeah, like, I'd love to talk to this, this guy. We connected and, uh, it was like one conversation. It was just me, like an outpouring of like, Hey, everything I was going through and, um, and him challenging me really. Like, it was like, oh, like you, you, like you have a choice in these moments. And, uh, so it, it was really, he gave me 
it, it gave me options to move forward in different ways. And, and, and then I was able to choose and try and choose and try and, and, and really decide, Hey, what do I want to get out of this moment in my life? Yeah. Uh, uh, of like being in the minors with young players and the impact that I want to have on them, on the coaches, uh, what impact do I want to have on my kids and my wife as they're seeing me go through this tough time? So it, it, there was a lot of things that I wasn't, I, I wasn't seeing as an opportunity or as a, as a moment where I could rise up and, and, and really model, um, what I want my kids to be uh, in these moments and, and, and during tough times. Um, and that's really like, Hey, I grabbed onto that and that was able to pull me out of that. It's awesome. Right? And now I've heard you started a program a couple of years ago with your wife, your wife's name's Brandy, right? Brandy, yes. Yep. Yeah. And Brandy, you started a program called 16, the 1616 program. Yeah. 1616. Tell, tell us uh, a little bit. Yeah. It, it was, it was actually like, it, it started in, in that time. So I, um, I started working with, his name is Dan Leflar, um, and started working the year before COVID. So actually we started working with him in the minors, worked my yeah. way up, uh, I, I, I worked my way back up into the NHL lineup and, uh, played two games. So I played one game, played well, got bumped up the lineup, played again in, uh, in Vancouver, scored. So like, uh, you know, like, oh, like things, like things are happening. Great. Uh, go to Calgary next day, the world shuts down. Done. Um, so, you know, went back, I was in the bubble yeah. for, went back for camp and was with all the AHL guys again. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I'm, it's going to probably be a long few months here. So I was in the bubble for, for three months. Cause we made it to the West, the, uh, Eastern conference finals. I actually yeah. was able to like work. I played in one of the, the Eastern finals games. Like I hadn't played in six months and they were like, hey, you're going in. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> so, and that was great. That was a goal of mine to get back there. And, and so, but when I, the point of this is when I came back the next season, we had taxi squads and uh, the shortened season and everyone was kind of still in the bubble and the minor league schedule was really short. So they didn't want me in the minors, the, uh, the taxi squads, I was making too much money. So they actually couldn't recall you call me on an emergency basis. So I was like useless there i couldn't 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 use me so i would literally call i would text lou lamorello at night it's like i get a text back at like 10 o'clock at night and be like hey like what what, what time can i skate tomorrow and he'd be like i'm in at two and i would yeah. go in and skate by my own for for a year Brutal. Um, so which was very very interesting as well because you're in a pandemic it's like everyone's already isolated again and then now i'm like even more isolated so through that, I was like, hey, uh, in a conversation with my coach, it was like, hey, like at the end of this year, like, what do you want to be proud of? Like, do, do you want to just like, you can skate, sure. Like maybe like you'll improve your like skills and you can stay in shape and all that stuff. But like, what do you actually want? Like, can you create something this year? And my wife and I had long been thinking of uh, very supportive of mental health and and obviously what I was going through and, and my wife had, had gone through throughout her uh, school journey and different stuff. So it was, it was something we, we supported. And I think we, we always had the idea that, Hey, like everything is very reactive in the mental health space. Yeah. There, there, there was not many, not many proactive ways to help, help uh, kids actually build skills and knowledge of, of um, getting in front of stuff instead of trying to yeah. help once they're already through it. Yeah. Yeah, and there, there's there's a great quote in it that from uh, Frederick Douglass, and it's it's easier to build strong children than repair broken adults. And what a what a great quote that is. Yeah, and, and that was really our thinking was like, hey, like I, you know, we're thinking of our kids, like, hey, we want to build a lot of these skills so that hey, when challenges hit, they have the skill set to either navigate those challenges. They're prepared for it. Yeah, they're prepared, or like even understand like who's around them to support them. Um, so, so bringing it back to like, even when I was going through what I was going through. So, uh, and, and that was really the start of 16, 16. And, and, um, so we wanted to create a program for, and use the the power of sport. There's so many great moments in sport. And, 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 you know, when you and I grew up, I think like we, we thought like, Hey, you didn't play sports to, to make it to the NHL. You played for like, like the values it was able to create in you and, and be a part of a team and, uh, you know, confidence and character that, that it built. So, um, I had a friend that was a researcher at Queens university in, in, um, Ontario and he, and his, his research team was researching positive youth development in sport. 
So how to create the ideal environment in sport to thrive, uh, led yeah. by Dr. John Cote, who's uh, world renowned in, in that space. And they said, uh, so research shows if you can impact the four C's, so competence, confidence, character, and connection, that you give the kids the best chance to thrive in sport, and then that translates into life. So, was, sorry, go ahead. Just awesome, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, so like that really resonated with me. And I was like, okay, like I wanna create a program around that. So what we came up with was, uh, and the other part of this is like, I found a nonprofit in Calgary called Impact Society that taught through through stories. So they found like, hey, kids, kids really resonate with stories. They'll remember stories forever, but they all, you know, give them information that's in one ear out the other. So I was like, yeah, that's, that's, that resonates too. So what we did was we created a program that taught these concepts through the power of story. So we went, went out and found different, different guys and girls and, you know, Blair Turnbull and Patrick Kane and Mark Giordano and Anders Lee, um, uh, are actually our, our 2005 world junior team is a story. Uh, yeah. the, the Vegas, Vegas Knights inaugural season is a story. Um, so we talk about the, the power of, of that connection and that group, um, and, and different stuff like that. So we're using those stories to teach the kids, uh, the power of these concepts and, and have them, uh, Hey, like reflect on where that, where is that showing up in, in their life right now? And, and then actually like, they'll go act like we, we have a, uh, iPhone style video halfway through, uh, every week that is a current player that says, Hey, this is what I'm doing in my life to work on this. Like, I'm going to challenge you to do that as well. So yeah. you. congratulations on you and Brady. I should point out that this program is free, it's which free, is awesome. Yes. And it's yeah. available anywhere in North America. And, exactly. and I want to tell our audience that you can register now for the 2024 season. Visit it's 1616.org and you can get started. And as a matter of fact, you can get a direct link to the registration portal on our YouTube page, which is amazing. Ladder, yes. it's amazing what you've accomplished, man. I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. Before I let you go, and you've been yeah. gracious with your time, can I play five fast facts with you? I ask you five yeah. quick questions. You give me five fast answers, okay? Yeah, sounds good. All right, time now for five fast facts with two-time Stanley Cup champion Andrew Ladd. Andrew, your best teammate you ever played with, who was it? Uh, Dustin Bufflin. The best coach you ever played for? Oh, man, I had some Hall of Famers. Uh, I'm going to say Joel Pondel. Oh, good choice. Uh, who did you hate playing against the most and why? Uh, Ryan Kessler. Because? Why? Uh because I, what's my honest answer? He was, uh, uh, I thought he was a pretender. Ooh, wow. Okay, fair uh, enough. I, 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 he, he would go after guys he thought he could he could intimidate. Wow, good for you, man. After all your success in your career on and off the ice, what's the one piece of advice you would give yourself if you can go back and speak to the 15-year-old Andrew Ladd? What advice would you give yourself? Oh, um... Keep going. Like I, I think it's like if you love what you do, just just keep working at your trade and 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 keep working at it. One final question: If you hadn't become a pro hockey player, what career do you think you would have had instead? Oh. <laughs> I actually don't even. It was all yeah. It was, it was weird. I was, what do I love? Um, Probably a public speaker, I'll tell you. You've been very eloquent in what you're doing. Well, yeah, you, you, well, you should have saw me at 15. I don't know if that would have been <laughs> the case. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't like, I, yeah, th that's actually one question. I was like, people, I, I had no, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was, I was all in on hockey. You know what? And it worked out really well. Five fast facts with Andrew Ladd. Andrew, thanks for this, man. I can't tell you how much I appreciated catching up with you again. It's 1616 dot org for people to get in touch with you appreciate it my friend i'm glad Thanks, you're doing so well appreciate it yeah thank you two-time stanley cup champion andrew Ladd. the overtime podcast is proudly presented by domino's pizza and athletes care if you're watching the big game at home or hungry right now domino's has got you covered check out the domino's mix and match deal Medium, two-topping pizzas, pasta, stuffed, cheesy bread, boneless chicken or classic chicken wings. Any two items for only $8.99 each. 
Canada's favorite pizza at dominoes.ca. Athletes Care is proud to be celebrating its 26th year offering sports medicine services to both elite athletes and the general population who require rehab for a new or chronic injury or pain. Go to where the best go. Athletes Care Sports Medicine Clinics with 24 locations in the greater Toronto area and Ottawa. Hey, if you missed any parts of the show, don't worry. Visit our website at overtimepodcast.ca where you can both listen and subscribe to future shows. The Domino's Pizza Overtime Podcast can be found on Spotify, iTunes Podcasts, or any of your favorite podcast platforms. As well, please check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel at O-Time Podcast. Until next week, I'm Gino Retta saying so long, hockey fans, and thanks for joining us on the Domino's Overtime Podcast. 